Hi, I'm Lee Keckner, and I'm so excited today because I get to speak with Dr. Ashley Winter. We're both working with Odella, all about women's sexual health and well-being. And by golly, Dr. Ashley Winter, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm, it's so awesome to be here and, you know, get together with you to talk about these important topics. So, so yeah. So, you know, this Odella has been really life changing for me because back they, they had kind of an in-person thing and I would go in person and talk about worthiness and knowing you're good enough to receive all of life's abundance and all these kind of like mindset things. But I learned so much about my own vagina and I am uh, 56 now. I think I started there when I was 54, 55 and I was blown away that there was stuff and I've been around the block and I want to brag. But that there was stuff I didn't know at my age. So I'm so happy to be talking to you. Yeah, you know, so I'm, my background is, um, you know, I have a fellowship in male and female sexual medicine. I'm also a board certified urologist. And so, you know, when I see female patients in the office, uh, you know, and, and do an exam of their genital area, uh, you know, I'll hand them a mirror and show them what I'm looking at. And, and what I always say to them is, you know, every guy I ever examined has been looking at his penis every day of his goddamn life. And have you ever <laughs> like a looked at, looked at your genitals, you know, and B had a doctor talk to you about what they're examining and show you what they're seeing. And, you know, Every single time, it's the first time anybody's even introduced that concept to them. So I think, um, you know, okay. Even how did for... you think that? They don't teach that in med school. I know they're very <laughs> clinical in med school. How in the hell did you think about putting a, a mirror by a vagina? Yeah, it's great. So in my fellowship, uh, the the amazing Erwin Goldstein. He's based out of San Diego, um, but he he was the person who started uh, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. Uh, he really has the first and only fellowship for physicians that's focused on sexual health, right? Like we use a lot, we, we, we jump around like men's health, women's health, you know, we jump around a lot of like pelvic pain. And, and he was just like, I'm going to make a fellowship in sexual health. And when I saw him examining women, he actually had very sophisticated uh, setup where, um, he would actually have like a closed circuit TV in the exam rooms and up on a screen, the woman, the women can see their huge vagina. Yeah. So they'd be like, here's your clitoris. And she's like, Oh my God, I didn't actually know what that, oh my gosh, like. that would be shocking. That would be shocking. You know, I yeah. found every time I went to my OBGYN, I would always say, how do you compare my vagina? Like big, little medium to other women's vaginas. And she would always laugh and say, Lee, it's fine. I go, I don't want to hear fine. I want specifics. Do I have big or am I, you know what I mean? Like I was always so curious, but she would laugh, which made me realize a lot of people aren't asking that kind of stuff. For sure. I mean, I've had women who are, you know, sexually active for decades, again, you know, would call themselves experienced and, um, and they come to my office and they say the words down there. You know, like, and I'm like, yes. your vagina, your clitoris, your vulva, your labia, what are you talking about? You're saying down yes. there. And, and it's we're, like just... we're so conditioned to be shy about it. So my yeah. sisters, I have three sisters and we, we came up with this word. It's really disgusting and I no longer use it, but we would call it our meatloaf. <laughs> and my sister would always say, you have bigger meatloaf. I have smaller meatloaf. Your meatloaf is like bigger on one side. I mean, and it was this word. And I remember when I went into Odella the first time and I was talking about, I said, well, you know, whatever my meatloaf. And they're like, what did you just say? And I was like, I didn't even realize that I was saying yeah. it or the impact it was having on me as a woman to call it anything besides this beautiful vagina right. that holds the one thing on our body created only for pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I know. No, it's amazing. Totally. I, I remember this guy in college called labia the pastrami curtain. Like, what the? <laughs> like, well, what did he call it? A pastrami curtain. Oh, that's that's almost as bad as meatloaf. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it stuck with me because it was so bad. It's so bad. It was okay, so, so bad. But yeah, I mean, it's not a bad word, right? These things are not bad words and it's not bad to look at them and talk about them with specificity. That's how we empower ourselves. That's how we make problems with them better, you know? So, so yeah. And you know, it's interesting when we put women's, 
you know, health or wellness, people are kind of leaning in. When you say women's sexual health and wellness, they lean back because we're so conditioned to not talk about sex, to pleasure ourselves. It's always used to be of service or a chore. You know, it's like related to so many negative connotations. Yeah. But really, it it's the most beautiful thing part of us to explore and to feel and to master, which is what I'm working on now. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So I was on um, like a daytime radio show um, with, with Dr. Drew a few years ago, and we were talking about, uh, you know, we're saying the words penis, vagina. And I remember walking out of the, the studio and the production guy was just kind of laughing and he said you know because the two of you are physicians we didn't have to beep out the words penis and vagina and even though it's like the middle of the day and it's on this like relatively conservative broadcast news program and and i was like shouldn't it be that nobody has to bleep out those words like those are anatomic terms right like it's It's not your nose your elbow your vagina it's not like you're saying f my vagina you're just saying vagina Right, right. Isn't and until that interesting. It's fascinating to me. And I was like, wait, you guys, if somebody says penis on the radio, you have to you have to dance around that or you have to like beep it out. How is that possible? I like you dancing know? around a penis. I like that how you just said <laughs> dance around it. Right. Okay, so our topic today, I wanted to get to know you a little yeah. bit and just talk about how excited I am to be a part of the movement of and I know it's been going on for a while, but I think um you know, we are going to be doing some series together, really blowing it out of the water. And I really like things that in life where people make it a big deal or heavy or all that, we talk about it like it's like, I like toast. Right. I, you know what I mean? I like yes. bacon or whatever, not bacon, because people might get mad about that. But I like toast. I like avocado <laughs> toast. The, where it's that normal. My vagina, I'm experiencing with my vagina. I learned something new about my vagina. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. I love that. I love this so much. Yeah. So yeah. our topic so, to oh, go, go. No, no. I mean, with Odella, so, you know, in, in terms of the overall mission, you know, one of the things that really drew me to it was seeing, you know, an organization at this level and, and kind of really trying to reach out on a broad level, you know, with, with telehealth care, specifically with this focus. Um, you know, my hope is to, to contribute more to that societal shift, to normalizing talking about these things, you know, normalizing, right, talking about toast and vagina, (laughs) you know, because I find every day in, you know, uh, as a one-to-one healthcare practitioner, I'm kind of fighting this battle again and again, you know, that that reaching one person at a time is not enough. And as, you know, of course we keep doing it, but, but we, we need we need bigger. I have to say <laughs> something that I learned. Yeah. Reaching one person at a time is enough. I'm just saying, if you can make a shift in one person, they tell so many people and they tell so many people. I mean, it was really that kind of grassroots. So I never want to take away the power of one. But with this platform that we're creating, right, we get to be yeah. really big and hit a whole yeah. bunch of ones at once. Yeah, definitely. Which I love. Definitely. Yes. Okay. Yes. So our topic today, I want to jump right into it because it's it's very exciting for me and I have so many thoughts and feelings and knowings um, yeah. is vaginal dryness. Now I yeah. have a couple questions and I'm going to just start with one. If you would, if you could answer this great doctor, what are the symptoms of vaginal dryness and why does vaginal dryness happen? Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are a number of different reasons vaginal dryness happens. Um, you know, I think the most common one that we think of is going through menopause, um, and postmenopausal states. Uh, there are other times you can have vaginal dryness. A common one that's overlooked is, uh, lactation. Um, so postpartum women can also, uh, have the same basic physiologic process. Uh, Wait, lactation, you mean when you're breastfeeding? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Great. Great clarification. So Uh, when you're breastfeeding, you can be dry. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. So breastfeeding suppresses uh, a lot of your hormones and your, it makes you have a low estrogen state um, and you can have vaginal dryness, sexual pain, discomfort. um, And it's oftentimes just completely overlooked, right? People are so focused on baby during that time period. um, But you know, your vagina is still existing. <laughs> so, so breastfeeding um, when you go through menopause. Yeah. Yeah. 
And also um, when you're and not really turned on by someone. Right. So, so this is a great, great clarification. So there are like two basic ways we can talk about this, right? Like lack of response to arousal or lack of arousal, lack of lubrication during sexual activity. Um, and then like a baseline vaginal dryness that's happening all the time, like not during sexual activity. Right. Um, so, and, and the two are related, right? If you suffer from like, you can have a very moist baseline vagina. Let's say you're not black breastfeeding you're you haven't gone through menopause. Uh, but yeah, your partner is not arousing you or doing what they need to do, or there's some issue where you're not responding to those stimuli the way you want to, and then you're not lubricating. Um, so that's one issue. Uh, and then if you're, let's say, have gone through menopause or you're on medications that suppress your estrogen and your other hormones, um, then you can also just have, you know, dryness, like you wake up in the morning and it's dry all the time. Okay. Right? So, so when you said so, earlier baseline dryness, now I wouldn't even know my vagina was dry unless I was trying to put up a tampon or a man's penis or something like that. Like, how would you just walk around knowing it's dry baseline? So, yeah, no. So this is this is a wonderful question, and this is so overlooked. So uh, when you have this baseline dryness, it's one of the symptoms of a condition that we call GSM, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, and that dryness can translate into uh, this sense of discomfort, uh, this sense of like I have to pee frequently. Um, so a you know, symptoms come along. There's symptoms yeah, for it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not necessarily saying, oh, I just feel like my vagina is dry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that lack of hormones, <laughs> you're not like waking up like, oh, I have a dry vagina this morning, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, when you walk in and somebody says, hey, I feel like I need to pee all the time. And hey, I feel like I have a UTI when I don't have an infection. I got my urine checked. There was no bacteria there. Um, you know, I, then, then you say to somebody, oh, that actually can be a symptom related to your GSM, related oh, to the fact that it. the hormone levels I are get low. It. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Can so I, okay. it's kind of like this mystery. Can <laughs> Not I ask, this mystery, mystery for most people who are going yeah, through right, it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Well, it seems like every symptom is a mystery and you kind of have to start going down the track to weed out what it's not and what it could be. Yeah. Yeah. A lot definitely. of times. Okay. So. Here's, an, here's a question that, that somebody, a community member has. I have been struggling for a while with the inability to produce enough lubrication during sex. This has caused a mm. rift between my partner and me. He thought I didn't find him sexy, and I was embarrassed because most of the time I would be turned on and want to have sex. I just couldn't get wet. What do I do? Right. So this is uh, such a common question, super interesting. So um, again, this is really a situation where I would be interested to know, is this person in a situation where they have lower hormone levels, right? So is this person perimenopausal? Are they postmenopausal? Are they on certain medications that can suppress your hormones? Like, for example, birth control can do this, be problematic for sexual function um, in many women. Um, so, so I want to know those things and try to modify those things. Right. Yeah. So Cause it, she it did say she gets or... turned on by him. Right. Right. Totally. And this, it, this can be this disconnect where, um, you know, you find your partner attractive, you're interested in sex, uh, and your body's not behaving the way you want it to. Right. And, 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 and I think also like she says, it's causing a rift. I think, I think sexually, things are more magnified. Like if one, you had an orgasm three times in a row and then you couldn't for a while. And then they're like, why can't you? And then you're in your head. Even like women can get in their head just as much as men not being able to get an erection. And I yeah. think that it's magnified somehow sexually when things are kind of like been oh. a certain way. Now you can't get wet. What's up? Right. Oh, this is huge. And I, I really, it's so important that you keyed into this because uh, more so than many, many other issues, uh, I see that people take on a personal level and an interpersonal level, uh, sexual 
function or dysfunction. And, you know, it's, it's really interpreted to be more than it's, than it is right and and i you know it's one of these interesting things where people say to me oh you know talking to people about sex all the time does that make you like sick of it or less interested in it and i i really say like it to me it just like normalizes how much it's just our bodies like us using our bodies as a tool to express something um but not but not more than that. Like, it, it, you know, we, we just over ascribe meaning to, to sexual dysfunctions. And, yes. sometimes truly and, and, and the partner, men and women take it yeah. personal. Like if a man can't get a heart on, maybe he's had a bad day or is in a fight or is really upset about finances or, is, you know, he's in his own head that he's not in the present moment. And then the girl's like, you're not turned on by me. Like we use it. So, you know, you used to get hard fast. What's going on? Oh, for sure. And he's like, you're not wet. I, I mean, I've had patients. No, no, I've had patients come to me and, uh, you know, they had like their prostate removed for prostate cancer and they had erectile dysfunction after that. And their marriage ended because their significant other w- was like, took it personally. Wow. Right. And, and you're like, so he mm-hmm. lost his dad right. and his <laughs> erection and his wife. That's, that's a punishing. And it happens all it happens all the time. And conversely, it happens, you know, with, with women going through sexual dysfunction. And I think so much around the time of menopause transition, because women aren't given the tools to uh, like address these problems. They're not given the tools to understand how it's physical. And it leads to a lot of, you know, partner and and relationship distress. Um, And it's tragic because it's, you know, not only can you understand the underlying cause, but a lot of times you can address the underlying cause. So Um, I want to say, are you big into or are you involved in your practice that kind of mind body connection? Huge. So, you know, I personally am not like, (laughs) I'm not excellent at the mind body connection, uh, you know, but no, it's that, that's great. That's really awesome. But when we talk like in medical literature about sexual health, we really say it's like this biopsychosocial model, um, which means that biophysical, you know, psycho, psycho meaning like, you know, your own cognitive component and then social meaning interpersonal dynamics. And, um, you know, that like it's hugely important to get somebody in, but then also make sure that they, you know, if they need sex therapy, that well, they you, have access you know why, to that. know why else um, I'm asking? I'm bringing this up, doctor, because I learn a lot on myself. This is kind of my classroom and I'm a spiritual yeah. teacher, um, life coach, but my whole thing is what we think here manifests in our world and our bodies, right? We think we're going to get sick. We're going to get sick. Huge. Like we think we're going to, you know, whatever. It, our body responds to what the mind tells it to do. So when this whole menopause thing, cause I'm 56 and I never even knew, um, if I was in it or out of it at pre, I just always feel good. And I remember my doctor saying, Oh, you're pre whatever. And then she's like, Oh, you're in it now. Mm-hmm. I'm in menopause. And I didn't even say, what should I expect? What does that mean to me? Because my body's working awesome. I've never felt better, been stronger. And I, if I hear anything like, and I think I did from some people, oh my gosh, are you dry? Oh, your sex is going to go way down. Or your, and I say, I choose not to own that thought. I choose not to believe it. And I choose to allow my body to do what it wants to do mm-hmm. when I'm excited. I'm not going to fall into any sort of beliefs yeah. of I'm a certain age, therefore I need to experience all of this list of downside or things. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, well, I think, you know, living your own truth and not reading through a list of things to tell yourself to expect those things, you know, can be very healthy. Um, you know, I, I think it's also good to get, raise awareness, you know, conversely, because there are so many people suffering without understanding. Yeah, I love that. Um, but, but yeah. I, I mean, love that, what you just yeah. said. But but, you don't. but it's kind of like if you're not suffering, you don't. <laughs> it's just been a big thing for me as I as I as I'm 56. Is yeah. people use the words "I'm old." I'm like, I'm not. I've never felt better in my life, and and it's the same thing. It's like so I have this man that I'm in love with, and um, because I have been with Odella for a while and learned things. You know, a fascinating thing I found out when I was there is that a man's penis can become erect within like 30 seconds to five minutes. 
and a woman to be fully engorged to receive or to be able to have an orgasm or, or at her maximum, you know, is 30 to 45 minutes. And I was like, holy hell. Then I really realized how important the kissing in my ear and my neck and playing with my neck, you know, doing all the things for me to prepare me to match where he is has been yes. huge for, for me. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so fascinating. So what you're talking about, uh, you know, is basically like this latency period. So, you know, the average t time to orgasm uh, for women is much longer than men. Um, and it, it's fascinating because I've had men come to me and say, oh, I have, I have premature ejaculation. And I say, oh, okay. Like how long, you know, after you begin penetration, do you, do you ejaculate? And they'll say, let's say 10 minutes. Right. And that's statistically above average. I would say actually, that's pretty right? long. And so then I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, no, it's a long time. <laughs> it is. And, and I'll say to them, you know, that's actually a, a, a above average, right. For how long you're lasting. So, so tell me why you think you have premature ejaculation. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, my, my girlfriend never orgasms and, you know, and I'm like, oh, that's not a problem with your <laughs> penis. You need to ask her how she's going to get an orgasm, right? Like, you know, you need to try vibrators. You need to amp up the foreplay, right? It's like, so holistic, uh, you know, way of envisioning somebody's sexual experience is so key. And, and we, you know, we have to give diagnoses, but we also can't over compartmentalize. I love, and, you know, if I you love, just, I'm, I'm going to jump in there real quick. Yeah. Cause I love what you just said that you said to him, you need to ask her what she needs, which is huge because normally the women are the ones who have to start conversations or have to try and help the men, but to empower men, right, that they can be a part of the conversation. And if they really want to please their girl, they can take the lead because maybe the girl hasn't been, the woman hasn't been oh, yeah. trained to talk openly yet because she's still been shamed from her church, her parents, her past experiences, whatever that she's holding. That, that, that I, that's what I'm, most excited so that true. we're going to do and we're doing right now is talking openly about it because the more we, it's normalized, right? The more we can ask questions and go, oh my gosh, yeah. you're dry. Yeah. I'm dry I, too. I like butter on my toast. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so this is probably maybe TMI, but I, when I was like single, you know, and I would start dating somebody and, uh, you know, we, we'd have sex and, and like, you know, I maybe not get off from penetration and the guy would be like, Oh, you know, is something wrong? And I'm like, no, nothing. <laughs> you did a great job. I'm not going to come that way here. This is what you, you knew can that do. Young? And you know, I never, Before Oh yeah. Med school? My, yes. Yes, I did. I don't know why, but I did. Damn. You were born yeah. to do this girl. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and I never ever had a guy say, this is a problem for me. Like they would see an authentic orgasm and be really excited about it. And, you know, maybe I was lucky enough to not be with jerks, but I think oftentimes we need to know how to direct people to have you ever have faked that a, pleasurable Have you experience. ever faked an orgasm? And they will be thankful orgasm. when we do. Oh, never, wow. never. I faked orgasms never. for 40 years. I, I, I guess think. I just did. Because my, see, the older generation oh are a little bit older than you. We yeah. were kind of taught to please the man or anyway, that's what I thought was to make sure my man was. And right. so I wasn't even sure how to, like, I didn't play with toys or anything like that. I knew a little bit that I could just, yeah. you know, do my own thing. But um, yeah. it's just this whole, exp I mean, it's so freaking exciting. I mean, for me, like a lot of women I know still don't want to talk about it. I'm like, you have no idea that limiting belief, what it's keeping you from, because my sexual experiences now are off the hook, but it's because I take enough time to care about myself yeah. and to share about what I want and to find a partner who's open to play and figure it out together, which makes it even hotter. And with this whole vaginal wetness so thing, much. and I'm 56 and I yeah. think that I'm in menopause, um, I say I think because when I had my first kid, they removed my uterus, but emergency C-section. So they left a little bit of my cervix. 
So anytime I had a period, uh-huh. it would be like a couple brown dots uh-huh. once a month, but never a full thing. But I still had all my hormones and everything. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure that because you, you as a doctor might be saying, why are you saying you're not sure if you've been through it? You'd be having periods, right? Or not having them. But I never really had them to know. Yeah. And I think another important point about the, the, you know, is not only, you know, kind of what you were talking about a bit being in tune with whether or not your body feels great, uh, is also just the fact that, you know, menopause transition is very different for different yeah. people. Right. So I will come in, I will have somebody come in and they're struggling and their symptoms are so intense. And I have somebody else who comes in and they're, and they're fine and it no, doesn't invalidate. That's right one experience or the other and it doesn't mean one woman yes. wasn't trying hard enough you know it, it a lot of it has to do with the receptors in your body and their sensitivity to hormone yeah. levels are different in different people and right I, and I, that's, yeah, that's i really fine. wanted to bring up the point because um, i just really heard again what you said that when i'm talking about my experience i choose to and i've been doing this for a while so maybe that's why it's affecting my whole menopause experiences I choose to hear things, but not own them or believe them. I I just go with myself, right? So what I want to say is I completely honor the people that are struggling. And I'm so happy that we're talking about that. I also want to offer people, you don't have to become what the symptoms say you have to become. So we do have a little bit of wiggle room, playroom with our minds, or if you are struggling to immediately get help, right? to find the things that can help or the hormones or the lubrication Definitely, is lubrication. Basically you give them hormones or they get some sort of lubricant if they're dry. Ah, so this is a great point that we should talk about with the vaginal dryness discussion. So, um, there are some great, you know, there's, there's lubricants that will be used during sexual activity. There's also, uh, things called like vaginal moisturizers that will, people will put, uh, in their vagina, just like not regardless of sexual activity to improve those symptoms associated with dryness. Um, that said, you know, in, from my professional standpoint, um, using particularly vaginal moisturizers really should only be if you truly, truly, truly feel like you are not in a position to use vaginal hormones. Uh, for treatment. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because if, if the tissue is not, um, like it, it's low on hormones, right? So then it's, then it's irritable. It doesn't have like the, this nice elasticity to it. It doesn't mm. have this responsiveness to stimulation that it should have, right? Like, so for example, there's actually two types of lubrication there's one that comes from your vagina and that like in response to arousal right there's the one that comes from your vagina there's also one that comes from an area called a vestibule which is around your hymen it's more external wait Um, wait wait your hymen is your and and those are actually two different types yeah no your hymen your hymen is uh (laughs) like you know, I'm sorry. You're... Now I'm going to start giggling like I'm yes, four. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Where were we? Okay. No, it's not meatloaf. It's not your meatloaf. Then... That's what we. <laughs> so what? Where's Where's the hymen? Oh, the hymen. Where, where is that? It's, it's right. So this is a great. This is a great like discussion. So you have your clitoris, right? And then you have like if we move from top down, right? So then you have your urethra, the opening of where you pee. Um, and then you move down and you have that, the, the opening towards your where your vagina is right. And that is the, that beginning of the entrance to your vagina is your hymenal ring. So this is like classically what you think of as people having, like when they're, when it hurts the first time they have sex, like they're popping the hymen, although oftentimes that's, that's not true. Um, but, but the external part um gosh and i I, this is hard without the diagram but basically um where your urethra right like you get past the labia and you're not yet in the vagina then there's this area called the vestibule so it's between the labia and outside of the vagina um and this area um is is like its own organ that people don't even know like your vulvar vestibule is things like nobody's heard of that 
and it's super important wow. and it actually makes its own type of lubricant so the vagina makes one type the vulvar vestibule makes another yeah so like for example oftentimes your vagina will be stimulated from something penetrating it but the vef- vestibule will not be so you could feel like irritation or chafing externally uh, even though you feel like there's some, like you're wet in your vagina. And that's because there's like two different types and actually the one, the vestibule wow. area. Um, Our vagina be... has two things lubricating yeah. it. How yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's super interesting. And I could go into like all this technical, <laughs> technical jargon about it. Um but, but the point being, if you don't ha- if you have low hormones, getting back to our prior discussion, right? Um, the blood vessels in your vaginal wall uh, and the and the glands in that vestibule, like they won't be able to work the way they're supposed to work, and they Got won't it. be able to respond to stimuli, right? So let's say your friend uh, or uh, your caller, right? Let's say they finished menopause. You know, they. That, I'm sorry, real quick. Vaginal estrogen is that a pill or a suppository? Suppository or cream that you put in your vagina. Okay, got yeah. it. And I could go on. Okay. We probably need like a separate episode for that specifically because I could... Oh, we'll do another yeah. <laughs> one. We'll do, we'll do another one. But so let's say, so this caller, right, who says, hey, I'm not getting lubricated. You know, it's it's frustrating my relationship, right? So that person, they're turned on, their partner's sexy, they're ready to go, they're mentally there. Um, but if the hormone levels are low, then the blood vessels in the vaginal wall are not going to dilate. And those blood vessels are what leads to the lubrication. Um, so it's mm. like, you know, it's like saying, I, I would expect somebody to, to cry in response to an emotional movie if they don't have tear ducts, right? Like you can't do it. Right. It's not like, it's not like they I don't like that analogy. <laughs> Yeah, like they if they feel yeah. the emotions, the body just doesn't Why are have you crying? the capacity. I am crying. Just no tears are coming out. <laughs> right. Right. Like you cannot <laughs> do it. Right. You cannot expect your body to do something it cannot do. I am turned on, but it doesn't know how to produce it because the things are constricted. Yes. Yes. The lubricant. Yes. So this is why, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to use lube. I mean, you can use lube, but it's not addressing the underlying physical issue right? Like, okay, so let's say this for the people listening. If you're using lube a lot, you might want to discuss it with your doctor because there's probably an issue or something going on that's causing that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, sometimes it's an issue with like, right, there's not enough foreplay, blah, blah, blah. But but if there's a, a very, if there's a really obvious cause, right? Like, you know, medications that suppress hormones, menopause, breastfeeding, then this is like a really great opportunity to do something that will address that issue. Right. So you're not That's sitting what there. I wanna... Yeah. Yeah. You're not sitting there suffering in silence. Yeah. And you're not sitting so there thinking like. So that's what I want to drive home. Yeah. Yeah. I want to drive that home. So Everyone listening, if it doesn't feel good, if you're not wet, if you're not, in, you know, enjoying it, if it's painful, if it's, even if it's traumatic, right, there's stuff to help. I mean, if it's traumatic from a past experience, you can work through that trauma and, and release it so you can welcome and love in the present moment, right? Yeah. And if it's anything with your body, you can, there are people like this wonderful Dr. Winter who are here to help you through it. <laughs> And that's what's going to be so cool about this um, um, Odella is that as they grow, right, their platform grows, people are going to have access to doctors like you with a click of a button or have a place to go to get the information instead of wringing their hands by themselves or going to their male doctor who's medically trained by the book and doesn't kind of get into that, look at your vagina stuff. You know what I mean? That there's this really welcoming, blossoming place that's happening right here with with us and with Odella and with the series that we're going to do um, with women's sexual health and well-being. Um, I'm just so excited about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm just really excited about it. And would you say kind of in a takeaway for today's um, topic of vaginal dryness, like would you have like one or two tips or one or two just things to kind of stick that they could take home with them today from listening to this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So vaginal dryness can, I'd say the following, right? Vaginal dryness can be something that leads to all the time symptoms, uh, or it can be something that leads to 
lack of lubrication in response to arousal or sexual activity uh, and oftentimes goes hand in hand but it can be both of those things um you know it's something that is oftentimes very very treatable and there are longer term solutions than using endless loop right and lubricant is yeah. great but i think we tell women like oh lubricant is like just moves use more lube or the classic thing that pisses me off so much like drink a glass of red wine like that's gonna fix the problem like <laughs> it's not gonna fix the problem <laughs> like, it's you know, gonna dull just... your senses stain your teeth and you're still gonna be dry <laughs> right it, it's it honestly it will probably make you more dry you're just like gonna care yes less. Like, for, like yeah, for you're me, not as present. yeah, for not as present. And some people truly like, uh, alcohol just, just is an inhibitor to sexual function. Like it's a, it's a disinhibitor to getting to the point of having sex, uh, because it's a social disinhibitor, but, but for a lot of the physical aspects of like enjoying sex, it's bad. Um, but, but, you know, not for everybody, but still the point being like the whole drink a glass of red yeah. wine kind of uh, diminishes people's like lived experience with this. Right. It's saying like it's in your head yeah. or whatever. Um, but, but yeah, so I think two types that there are longer term solutions and just using lube, um, you know, that, um, yeah, talk to your healthcare provider, uh, you know, and if you feel like you don't have somebody, you know, in your healthcare team, um, then, then, you know, hit up Odella because we have, tools for you and this is a welcoming place for that discussion so so yeah so doctor if they want to get a hold of you or want to reach out to you should they reach out to you on twitter with a message or how <laughs> what would be best way yeah they I have mean, a question or want to comment on what you we talked about today or yeah no it's great i mean if they want to shout out to me on twitter that's definitely on social media where i'm the most active uh it's actually what are you what's your handle a S H L E Y G, uh, which is my middle initial, and then winter like the season. Um, and Ashley G for G spot winter. <laughs> oh, I love that! Mm -hmm. I could tell. You're we could welcome. do a whole episode on the G spot because I know. Oh gosh, know we're going to because that I excites know me. <laughs> I want you to tell me everything you know about it next episode. And I know so much about it. There's so much science behind it, and like nobody knows that. It's, it's okay. Incredible. Number one, <laughs> we have already set what our next topic is. It's the G spot. I love it. By Ashley G winter. Oh my God. I love, I love this. It. I love this. I um, love it. And I want to do a little uh, takeaway too, if I may. Yeah. So, so to sum up what you just said, I'm going to say, if you're overusing lube, think about exploring with your doctor or other ways that you can do it um, in a healthy way without having to just try and wipe it down each time you can do something yeah. that's really going to help you long term yeah definitely definitely so i guess the goal would be less lube because you have more or, uh, organic <laughs> wetness right or yeah. lubrication or moisture i guess yeah. definitely definitely my my takeaway is um that i want to say because i always am kind of on the opposite spectrum of like all the heavy stuff is that allow yourself the possibility or thought that my body knows what to do. And if I'm aroused, it, I mean, I'll just have to say I'm 56 and I'm, I'm, I'm in love with a guy who's 63 and I think about him and I get what yes. I mean, yes. my car driving, I'm like, oh my God, like, I can't wait till his hands touch me or he kisses me or yes. just his arms. And I'm just like, well, I haven't experienced this lubrication before. And at 56, like I'm, yes. it's, it's happening more than ever because I have oh, this I kind of, it heart animal attraction but heart centered too it's like this whole thing it's so gorgeous so allow yourself the thought that if you're coming up on your mid 40s or nearing 50 I can be more than the symptoms that they say are, are going to come that I can be an exception to the rule just by allowing my body to continue what it's going to do so that's on the opposite side and the other part is hell if you're experiencing it and everything like you're saying is kind of not reacting the way it's supposed to anymore. Reach out to Odella, reach out to Dr. Winter, to myself, to, you know, just look, go to someone um, because yeah. we, we're not here to suffer, right? We can find no, I, ways I, around it. I mean, I've had patients come to me, you know, in their eighties and say, like, you know, come in with a, with a sexual concern and say, 
I don't know, maybe I'm just too old for sex. And I'm like, you're not too old. You're, you're too old when, when you don't want to do that anymore. I love that they're asking that at 80. <laughs> oh I my God. I've, I've, yes, yes. I want to I've be done, that woman going, I'm 80 now and I'm experiencing some dryness. <laughs> right? Yes. But that's the that's thing. Good. You can't like you. And this is when we go into our vaginal estrogen episode. That is something that's safe and effective and you can literally take it forever. Like there's a lot of discussion on how long hormones are safe, but vaginal hormones are, are safe forever. And I promise you when I go through menopause, I will be using vaginal estrogen and I will continue it until like the day I die. <laughs> like, I, I, love I will it. write this on my tombstone. Like <laughs> take vaginal this estrogen. Is the, this is her going to be Reddit or you and on her tombstone i will use <laughs> vaginal what is it called until i die vaginal estrogen yes yes yes, yes. dr winter you know in the end of her days maybe you know if she at least had had a moist <laughs> like but i i mean it's it's a it's a fundamental part of human i mean the physical like lived experience like it's not it's not a luxury it's basic health right yes and we all deserve it. And the connection it. and the release and the endorphins when you orgasm or when another person touches your body and when you feel that physical love, it's like the greatest release of feel good in your body. Yeah. It's yeah. so good I mean, for your health I, and mental health. I, I hate when people act like sex is not health. Like sex is health just the same way like seeing and eating and walking down the street. And it is fundamental to our nature and to our wellness. And like we should expect that you know it was like god or the higher to... power or, or what knew exactly what they were doing when they created that part of oh, our yeah. bodies and we are to Hell enjoy yes. it and explore it i love yes. it yes yes okay you guys so if you want to reach out to me i am lee keckner and you can get me on instagram at at lee which is l-e-i-g-h keckner k-o-e-c-h-n-e-r um, I'd love to hear from you and you can reach out with Dr. Ashley Winter at Ashley G Winter G-spot. on Twitter. Um, and next time we'll be discussing the G spot, which right now I would like to just pop some like confetti things. Cause that's the oh my jam. God, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm so excited. I will out. blow your mind. <laughs> I can't wait. So doctor, thank you yeah. so much for your time. I'm so happy to be partnering so with welcome. you through Odella. And um, I look forward to our G spot talk. 